Well, the first thing I'd probably say is I'm on my 70th trip around the planet now, which I actually didn't expect would happen. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But um, I have been a teacher in two careers. One, I've, for five years I taught music in schools in the U.S. And for the last 25 years I've been a teacher of massage and bodywork in the U.S., in the U.K., in Jamaica, in Malaysia, and um, some other places. And now I have some students who are also teaching for me. So I really respect the concept of teaching. And I also respect the concept in teaching that, generally speaking, we teach what we need to learn. So, I have learned quite a bit through the course of my life by the fact that I have been involved in seven different surgeries in my life. The first three were what I would call childhood. We probably don't really need these surgeries, but this is what the tradition 60 years ago was. That is to say tonsillitis, appendicitis, that sort of thing. So, the first three were, let's don't call them unnecessary, but we can think about that. I've also had two emergency surgeries, and then I have had two elective surgeries to repair the emergencies. So let me talk about those a little bit. In 1987, I was returning from a Thanksgiving vacation to Disney World in Florida with one of my friends and his two sons in his private plane. When he ran out of gas, on his approach to land and refuel. So he had to pull the plane down hard and fast. We crash landed on the embankment of a roadside. He made a 90 degree turn, landed on a 45 degree angle, and we hit the ground at 60 miles an hour and stopped pretty dead on. I was injured very badly here. I didn't realize I should tuck and roll and protect myself. So I had an amazing gash up here with 30 stitches and bone damage, etc. And that was the part of me that really hurt. I knew my back was broken. I could tell my back was broken. I was a body worker. I knew my body. And I could tell my back was broken, but frankly the head hurt so much that I couldn't even think about the back. I was immediately out on the wing of the plane doing pelvic lifts trying to stretch my back and breathe. Fortunately, it was a Sunday morning in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Church had just gotten out, so we had plenty of help to stop and uh, try to pull us out of the plane. And everybody is saying, oh, we've got to get him out. There's a fire. We've got to get him out. There's a fire. There's no fire. We're out of gas. All right, we got to the hospital, which was a horrible experience because here I am in a strange town, separated from the people I know. Lights, 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 all of these uh, fluorescent lights bearing down on you, people jumping in your face saying, were you the pilot? Do you have insurance? Who's your insurance provider? It was a devastating experience, which even as I bring it back, it comes up just as strongly the second time the third time, the hundredth time. After the tests, we realized that I had a compression fracture of L1. L1 being right about belly button, that spinal bone that just happens to be one of the most sensitive places you can break. My spinal column had been compressed to roughly 10% of the area it should be occupying. And that little L1 area is the place where the cauda equina, or horse's tail, is the place where all of the nerve system splits into little various pieces and goes to various functions. So we didn't know what was going to happen to me. At that point in time, I couldn't move my leg. I had no feeling. I had no feeling through my pelvis. And it was entirely possible that I would lose sensation in my legs, that I would not be able to walk that I would lose sexual function, bladder function, and bowel function. So, here's the doctor. Well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to open you up. We're going to have a neurosurgeon. We're going to have an orthopedic surgeon. The neurosurgeon is going to try to tease those nerves back together. The orthopedic surgeon is going to put your bone together as well as he can. Then we're going to fuse your spine from T10 to L3. Then we're going to put in Harrington rods, which were stainless steel, titanium, I don't know, but seven inch long rods into your back. 
then we're going to put you in a body cast. I said, what if we just put me in a back brace for as long as you wanted and let me heal myself? And the doctor said, it doesn't matter what we do to you. Your nerves are dead anyway. I said, thank you. Let me have some time. I took some time after I got everybody out of the room, which was probably five hours. I finally scanned my body, realized I couldn't breathe into the back, into the low back. I spent about an hour breathing. And when I finally felt breath going into my low back, I thought, there, I can go to sleep now. I believe I would be paralyzed today if I hadn't had that inner knowing. So that was quite an experience, and I healed remarkably well from this surgery. Partly because I had already been in training as a body worker and I knew my body well, partly because the community where I lived, I was surrounded by alternative practitioners who were so supportive of me. I had acupuncture, I had chiropractic, I had nutritional supplements, I had massage, I had body work, I had people almost around the clock wanting to help. I did very well, even though it took about a year before I could lift myself up a step with my left leg. Ten weeks in a body cast that went from here to the pubic symphysis and weighed 30 pounds. It was a long, hard ordeal, and it really was about a year's recovery, and I won't say that I'm 100% recovered, but again, this was when I was 37, I am now almost 70. So I've lived a pretty full life of many added years that I'm lucky to have had. Now, a year and a half later, I decided to have the rods removed. When I told the first doctor who did the work, because I didn't do it in the town where the man said, your nerves are dead, I went to my hometown and let a man work on me there. That was somewhat a mistake as well, because he wasn't a very good communicator. But I had the surgery to put the rods in. A year and a half later, I had the surgery to remove the rods. When I asked him to do it, he said, we don't do that. I found someone who did. And since it was a private pay at that point in time, I was in the hospital and out of the hospital in a day and a half. I was up the afternoon after the surgery going, I've made a dreadful mistake because it hurt so badly. Imagine if you have been had bone spacers for a year and a half and then suddenly you remove the spacers. Everything screamed. I got over it. That surgery also, things went pretty well. So... 2016. I'm still having trouble with this body. I expect to have trouble with this body the day I die based on that plane wreck. So digestion, elimination, these things are difficult for me. 2016, finally at the insistence of my private care doc, I had a colonoscopy because he'd been saying, you know, I'd feel better if you did this. All right. When you have a colonoscopy, you sign a piece of paper that says, now, if we puncture your colon, it's not our fault. One month later, the day of the election in the United States, 2016, I lay in bed all day going, I don't feel right. I don't feel right. Finally, at 2 in the morning, we went to the emergency room, and after the test, it was like, you have a perforated colon. We're going to cut seven inches of your colon out. We're going to tie off your anus, and we're going to put a hole in your abdomen through which you will now evacuate your bowels. Then you'll wear a little bag on your stomach. I didn't see an option. I couldn't see any other way to do this. So I said yes to the surgery. Basically, I sailed through that surgery as well. I did not like a colostomy bag. I never could manage to keep that darn thing from leaking. It was a horrible, horrible experience, but it was another learning experience. <clears throat> Six months later, I decided, let's reverse that. I want to be hooked back up so that I can be a regular person again. I talked to the doctor. This was the doctor who didn't do the first surgery because he was too busy. 
but told me what was going to happen and that he would do the second surgery. When I met the doctor who was doing the surgery and asked him to pray with me, he felt so good that I said, would you consider doing the second surgery as well? And he said, no, your other guy is much better. All right. I met with this first doctor and we talked about what was going to happen. He said, you know, you sailed through that first one. This one's going to be a piece of cake for you. Yeah, this scar will be a little longer. I had a six inch scar in my abdomen. The scar will be a little bit longer. You'll be in the hospital three days, maybe four, and you're going to do just fine. All right. Well, we got to the hospital. The scar ended up going from six inches to ten inches. They rip the colon off of the spleen, and as they ripped the colon off of the spleen, <clears throat> I hurt and hurt and hurt. But most disgusting to me was I knew my body, I knew what I wanted to do, and I knew that I needed to take my probiotics. The probiotics, you've got your antibiotics, which kills everything. If you don't put probiotics in, you're prone to some pretty bad things. So I said to the nurse, oh, I need to get my probiotics over there. She said, you can't have those. The doctor said, nothing by mouth. I said, what about those Tylenol you're giving me? She said, you talk to the doctor. I talked to the doctor. He said, no, don't take probiotics. I listened. That was foolish. Because a day later, I had C. diff. Clostridium difficile is one of the few really bad bugs in the colon that is not killed by antibiotics. And so it thrives. And so it thrived so much that for 60 hours I had incessant diarrhea and wanted to die. I got through it. That was the hardest one. That was the hardest one. Now, in 1989, when I had the second surgery, I thought, I should write a book about this stuff. Man, I've lived through some stuff here. And I have some ideas about what people need to do around surgery. As an example, the first doctor, when I was in my hometown getting ready for the surgery, every morning before his rounds, my partner and I would get together and we would think about what questions do we want to ask today. We would write them down. She's a professor of communication. I'm a body worker. I know my body. She knows the words. And he would be backing out of the door on question two. So, I know about these people, I know about this situation, but I sort of let that go. But then, in 2016 and 2017, after that second surgery, I said to myself, you've got to get this down. People need this information. So that's why I've written this book. I hope that this book can stimulate people both to start taking better care of themselves so that they don't require a surgery, then stay on that preventative track, but if they find either an emergency or an elective or something coming up, how they can prepare themselves to be ready for that insult, and then how they can repair themselves after that insult. You know, every experience in your life is a learning situation, and that's fine. And it's also important, I believe, that we all start taking a little bit better care of ourselves, a little bit more responsibility for ourselves, and make a little bit smarter choices. So I hope this book will encourage you to think in that way. Assume that your body is your vehicle. How do you treat your vehicle? How do you treat your car? Do you ride around with junk in it all the time? Do you change the oil? Do you rotate the tires? Do you keep air in the tires? Do you burn a good gas or do you burn the cheapest stuff with water? Do you ever bother to change the oil filter, the air filter, the Freon? 
How do you treat your car? How do you treat your body? It is your vehicle. It's the one that should take you for 200,000 miles or 85 years or 90 years. But if you're not going to take care of it, it's not going to take care of you. So, how do you maintain it? I had a client, I have a client, who is now my financial planner. And he used to drive all over our part of the state to see his clients. And one day he came in and said to me, you know what? I've realized I need to see you every 6,000 miles. It makes a lot of sense. How are you maintaining your vehicle? It's simple. It's not easy. If we think about it and choose to take care of that vehicle, it will run forever. An example, my mother lived until 87 when she had a little accident that caused some various severe difficulties. But I remember being a, a child and watching my mother sit with her friends in the living rooms, in the couches, slumped down in the couches with their arms folded over their bellies. All of these women had this interesting little belly and my mother died as a result of an aneurysm in her aorta. Her aorta came down like this, went like that, and came down like this because she had collapsed herself for years and years. I think about my father who died at age 60. Now here again, I'm nearly 70 and I'm not going to be my father. I'm going to be my grandfather who went to 92. But my father had his first heart attack at 54. And why not? He believed you had to have meat and potatoes for every meal. The meat and potatoes needed to be fried my mother salted everything. She didn't like cooking wild game, so she burned it angrily. He would salt after she had salted, then he would taste, then he would salt. He also drank incessantly, and he also was not very happy with the work he was doing or the life situation he was in. Why wouldn't you want to check out? So we've got to think about our purpose in life. We've got to think about what brings us joy, what motivates us, what makes us happy, what gets us excited about our lives so that we will take care of our vehicles because we want to run around this track a lot of times. Another example, I see a lot of people as a body worker who have sciatica issues. Primarily, it seems to me, I see people who have sciatic pain in the left side and the left leg. My first question is, do you drive a lot? Many of them do. And after you think about it, you realize that if you're driving, you tend to put your weight over here and work on this. So if you simply would shift your weight to the other side, move the pillows, sit differently in your chair, think, take care of yourself, move, stretch, breathe. You can probably prevent a lot of these problems. If my father had decided to chuck it and find a job that he enjoyed, if my father had decided to quit drinking, if my father had known back in those days that salt was killing him, perhaps he would have changed something. I don't know. This is the problem. It is our choice. We've got to make the decision that we're going to change something. So, what is your life like? Are you having fun? Do you have grandkids? Do you have children? Do you have a job that you love? Do you have a car that you love? Do you love decorating your home? We're all addicted to something. Can you find a positive addiction that gets you enthusiastic about getting up so that you want to move, you want to do, you want to grow, you want to do things? Too many people are just going through life doing the motions, and waiting to die. Don't be that person. In this book, Preparing for Your Surgery, I've called on two of my friends slash colleagues slash family. Uh, Dan Kibler is a physical therapist, physiotherapist in the United States, who has practiced for about 35 years, and at age 68 could not 
get rid of his hip pains, tried every alternative he could find, looked, thought, planned, tried, and couldn't find something to work and ended up having this surgery. But he gives his insights into what he did to prepare himself and to rehabilitate himself. Second, I have a brother-in-law, Dr. Ralph Harvey, who has been somewhat my family practice doc off and on for a lot of years via telephone. He's great. And I've asked Ralph at the end of the prevent, prepare, and repair chapters to put in a few last words from the doc. And it's interesting to see a doctor who doesn't get quite stuck in that medical community establishment mindset. So the book, as I've tried to write it, is going to offer a lot of motivation because it's going to try to get you to start thinking about, geez, I don't get up much, do I? Maybe I should get up to turn the TV on and off. Maybe I should walk a hundred steps every morning. Maybe I should lay in bed and work my feet around or write my name or write the alphabet. There are so many things we could do. Maybe I should cut out diet sodas, which we are finding more and more are pretty much purely poison. Maybe I should cut down on the alcohol intake. Maybe I should cut down on the fast foods. There are a lot of things that we can be doing. I try to discuss most of them in the book. I'm now at around 35 years as a body worker. My first career was as a musician and an entertainer and I did about 10 years of that work. And then one day I picked up Ida Rolf's book. Ida Rolf talks about rolfing and physical reality. Who's this old lady? What does she know about physical reality and what is rolfing? She was a body worker, had grown up in New York City, had arthritis in her own body and started working with the fascia or connective tissue system of the body and started healing her own arthritis. I thought this sounds good. The first thing she says in her book is, this is the gospel according to Rolf. When gravity gets flowing appropriately through the body, then spontaneously the body heals itself. Wow, that makes sense. I'm a musician. All of a sudden I'm getting so turned on by this lady's ideas that I called the Rolf Institute in Boulder, Colorado and said, uh, are you people for real? Uh, I want to come and train with you. So I trained with them in 1985, 6, certified in 86, disaffiliated in 1990 when they got into politics and split ups and all that kind of thing. But I have pursued my own path that is based a lot on what Ida Rolf had to say about fascia and connective tissue and the trauma stored in the body and how if we can realign our bodies in gravity we're going to be better. But I have, over the years, morphed into my own being more and more. So my evolution I call core body work. Core, in my acronym, means coax, order, restore energy. In the old days, when I first came up with that, it was creating order and restoring ease. One day I thought, wait a minute, I don't create anything in someone else, I coax it. This is a big difference. This is a really important difference. And this is what I try to teach both my students of bodywork and my clients. You are in charge of your process. We can have a partnership, but I want you to be the director of this partnership. I don't want you to lay there go, do whatever you think is right. I want you to tell me what's going on in your body all the time. So the first thing I'd say is I've learned to listen to and to care about and to respect my clients. We don't get that from doctors enough of the time. They're getting better. Thank you, Lord. Does your doc do it? Most of mine didn't. I've mentioned in another little uh, blurb, I mentioned the doctor who would be backing out of the room when my communication professor partner and I were asking him questions. She'd have the list. She's good. 
She can get in there and get her answers. Even she couldn't get her answers. So, second, I think I have discovered over the last five years the importance of the vagus nerve. V-A-G-U-S. The Latin word vagus means wanderer. And it is indeed a wanderer. It's the only cranial nerve that comes out of the skull, comes down through the carotid channel, makes two little trunks, and makes an upside-down tree all the way through the abdomen, the thorax, where it innervates everything. All of the organs, all of the systems are innervated by the vagus nerve. Now, what gets interesting is the very oldest vagus nerve is the reptile brain system that says, oh my God, play dead. The next system that we have to work with is the spinal column's sympathetic, parasympathetic system. The sympathetic system says, oh my God, we're in trouble. What are you going to do? You're going to run away or are you going to stand and fight? So we've got those three default corners in a triangle. We can either play dead and shut down like a possum would do or like a mouse would do when the cat plays with it, and we'll do that. Or we could go, I can do this. I'm tougher than you. Or we can just go, I'm out of here. Most of us tend to default into one corner or another. My partner, she's a fighter. Me? I run away. My daughter, she plays dead. Right in the middle of that triangle is the place we want to live. It's the place I call the find it, feel it, face it, forget it. We need to re-establish our social engagement system. Instead of being offended by, instead of being afraid of, instead of being overwhelmed by, which is one of the new diseases of the century, I believe, overwhelm. Instead of being overwhelmed by, we need to figure out how to go, right, how am I going to deal with this now? And get on with our life. The vagus system is the most important system of the body as far as I'm concerned. The man who wrote the original book, who's been researching over 30 years, Stephen Porges, calls it in his book the anti-anxiety nerve. I think of it as the nerve of well-being because I prefer that positive spin. So, when I'm working with clients, I'm always trying to do what I think of as a vagal reset. Take a deep breath. You're doing fine. Take a deep breath. You're doing fine. Therefore, I also choose to validate people. I choose to create a partnership with people. I choose to get them working with me, for me. Take a rubber band and stretch it. Nothing's happening. Oh. 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 The more ways one can think to stretch the more directions we can put into a stretch, the more we're stretching. The more we're stretching that fascia, that connective tissue, the more we are starting to oil our bodies and oil our bones. So I've got my clients on my couch or table stretching and breathing. How do I know when I'm too deep? They stop breathing. If I take somebody's breath away, I've just chased their trauma in deeper. Now, when's the last time you had a doctor who thought in any of those kind of terms? So for me, this is the critical stuff to get better and better at allowing the client, the patient, the patron, whatever you want to call them, allowing that person to be in charge of their process and assisting them coaxing them as they work through their process. The more we can assist and coax and lead education, education, the word means to lead out of. Can we lead people out of their trauma and keep them safe? Stephen Porges, the man who wrote the original book about the vagus nerve, said in an interview, the pivotal point is, can we get people to feel safe? 
Isn't that a great question? So, the more I work in my world, the more I'm working to try to create safety in that vagus spinal column system so that people don't have to run away to their corners, but they can stay right in their centered place and deal with life as it comes to them. So much of this book applies to my practice because I've been doing this, as I said, for 35 years. And when I can teach people to be in partnership, and when I can teach them to take charge of that partnership, then we have succeeded. So in terms of giving advice for an upcoming surgery, if something is imminent, I'll probably refer to notes a little bit because I'll, I'll probably want to make sure I get several interesting points in. And the first one I would have to say is, it's your process. Stay in charge. Trust your gut. I did not trust my gut on the last doctor who worked on me, on the repair surgery that just about killed me. From the first minute I met him, I thought, there's something wrong about this. I don't, I don't like this man. I don't resonate this man. I don't want this man touching me. And I let him touch me. When I had the first emergency surgery, I checked in with a fairly world-famous doctor who happened to be a client in my town. And I said, who would you recommend to do this surgery? And he said, well, there's X. Technically, he's brilliant, but he's not a very good communicator. At that point in time, I thought, well, I want technical brilliance. These days, I'm not sure but what I'd go for a good communicator. It is your proce process, and this has been one of my biggest learnings. We are finding more and more that we have a head brain and a gut brain. And there's a book called Blink by Malcolm Gladwell where he quotes a little piece of research that says, People who trust their gut are usually right more often than people who trust their head and overthink. So I invite you to listen to that still, small voice within. And if it says this is not right for you, pay attention. There's nothing wrong with a second opinion or even a third opinion. And there's nothing wrong with going on until you find someone who you feel cares about you. Listen to your body. Take charge in other ways. One of my friends in Michigan has written a song for her church and the words are our thoughts are prayers and we are always praying. Our thoughts are prayers. Take charge of what you're saying. Seek a higher consciousness, a state of peacefulness, and know that God is always there, and every thought becomes a prayer. What are you praying for? Because chances are you're getting it. Put more simply, what you focus on expands. Oh, oh, this hurts so bad. Oh, oh, I don't have enough money. Oh, oh. Why doesn't he love me? Oh, oh, why don't my kids come to see me? What you focus on expands. Clean yourself out as much as you can before a surgery. This starts with something as simple as less junk food, more healthy food, more fruits, more vegetables, more nuts, more whole grains, less meat, healthier fats, less trans fats, less alcohol, less sodas, less diet sodas, which we are seeing more and more, are pretty much purely poison. It's amazing how insects won't even come around some of these things. So clean yourself from the inside in terms of what you're putting into the system. More water, less soda. But also clean yourself with more movement. If you don't get out of your chair all day long, perhaps it would be wise if you decided to walk around your table once every hour. I have had clients who sit at a computer often, eight hour days, 10 hour days, 12 hour days. I've suggested to them, is there some way you could program your watch, your clock, your computer, so that it dings at you every five minutes so that you have to go 
every five, every ten? Can you take a break? Can you stand up? Can you walk around? Can you move? Can you be aware of your body and quit putting it through such strenuous non-activities or such strenuous tightening activities? Let's talk about breath because most of us don't breathe. I've been a body worker all these years, 35 now. A new client is lying on my couch and I'll say, all right, let's see a big breath. And here's what I get. Did I miss something? Okay, take another big breath. I had a very powerful man in London, financial wizard, I don't know what, but so tightly wound that when he took a breath, it went, and that was his deep breath. I thought, right, this man is an achiever. So I said to him, now, I would like you to an achieve a count of seven when you breathe. Ah, he got a breath. From then on, we could work. Sometimes I'll just put my hand on someone's stomach, costal arch, and say, now push my hand away. If somebody can't get a breath, they can't be healthy. There is new research going on that's quite incredible because it's talking about heart rate variability. And heart rate variability suggests that when you breathe in, your heart rate goes up. And when you breathe out, your heart rate goes down. And the greater the number you have between your heart rate going up and your heart rate going down, the healthier you are. So your heart rate variability is a determiner of whether you will have cancer, whether you will have heart problems, whether you will have diabetes, whether you will have anxiety, whether you will have fibromyalgia. A simple indicator of heart rate variability can tell you how healthy you are going to be. And they're now realizing that one of the simplest ways to enhance heart rate variability is to find your specific ultimate breath rate. Most people have a uh, more, uh, more ordered breath rate between four and a half and seven breaths per minute. So even if you think of taking a breath this way, one, Five or ten minutes of that is absolutely not going to hurt you. And it's certainly just as good for you as watching Strictly Come Dancing or Dancing with the Stars. There's a man in Holland named Wim Hof, W-I-M-H-O-F, who's even got online exercises to teach you how to breathe more appropriately. You can find them anywhere, everywhere. Start thinking about your breath. And realize that if you will breathe in for a bit and out for a bit longer, you're exchanging the bad stuff for good stuff. So the diet, the breath, the movement, the thoughts. What you focus on expands. So if you're worrying about this surgery, you might get what you're praying for. And if you're going, I can do this, it's going to be all right. There's a, a U.S. physician and author named Rachel Naomi Remen. I could not find, I could not source where I read this from her, but she talked about being prepared for a surgery, and her doc said, now this is a very difficult surgery, and I expect you're going to have a really hard time. And she had done her prayer, she had done her meditation, she had done her getting her mind in the right state. She had done all the things in the doctor said, I can't believe how you just sailed through that. Quite often I'll have clients say, I can't believe how I just sailed through that. Or quite often I will have clients who have had good deep body work say, you know, I took an amazing fall. I'm amazed that I didn't break something. Or I did this little accident, but the next day I was fine. 
That's pretty exciting when you see the results of preventative work, preventative self-work. Have a support network. Have an advocate, at least one. I used to think that if I wanted to start a new business, and perhaps in my dotage, I will start a new charity whose purpose is to go to hospitals or doctor visits with people who have no one to advocate for them. Doesn't that sound like a really worthwhile thing to do? Because when you go to see your doctor or when you're talking about this surgery, you can't hear everything because your mind is racing a thousand miles a minute and you're trying to think, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. cancer, he said I have cancer. What am I gonna do, I have cancer. And he's saying, wah, 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 and you're going, cancer, I have cancer. You need someone there. You need someone to be able to ask the questions that you have discussed in the first place. You need someone to hold your hand and be there with you. And it can be as simple as someone in the hospital when you go, oh my God, I can't believe they've left the buzzer just out of my arm's reach. Oh my God, my water is over there on the tray and I think I'm so thirsty. Oh, I am so cold and I can't even find the blanket. You really need someone to be there and help you as much as possible. So the advocate can be not only that no doctor, you're talking to two of us now, and we want answers. But it can also be the person who just says, yeah, pity patty, pity patty, yeah, you've been through a lot. It can also be a person, based on how you ask them to react, who says, get over yourself. Everybody has done this before you. You're going to make it through. Both of those are valid. You know what you need. Be honest with yourself. Go easy on pain meds. Back in the old day, in 1987, when I had my first tremendously, tremendously painful surgery, and I thought, Lord, is it going to get better than this? One night I was sitting in the hospital and I was thinking to myself, well, you'll never ride a bicycle again. Well, you'll never do this, you'll never do that. You're never going to have flexibility again because I was fused this far. And something from the heavens said, you are not a flexible, you are not an inflexible person. Right. But I had the IV and the little button. And they said, oh, you know, you just use that button whenever you feel like it. Well, I heard a lot. So I was using that button whenever I felt like it. As a result, I didn't have a bowel movement for a month. Be careful of those pain meds. We're starting to get away from that little on-demand business and realize that opioids are now being shown research-wise to be not really more effective than Tylenol, Aleve, and those kind of over-the-counter pain relievers. So all of these people who are addicted to opioids are addicted to something that isn't even helping them that much. So be very cautious about your meds. And I would strongly advise, realize again, I am, again, realize, please, I am not a doctor. So I'm not prescribing anything to anyone. But I am suggesting <clears throat> that probiotics have saved my life. Um... We have three kind of biotics. We have the antibiotics that kills almost everything in your system. So as it kills the bad stuff, it also kills the good stuff. And it doesn't kill all the bad stuff. Thus, I had C. diff after my last surgery, Clostridium difficile, and almost died in hospital where I picked it up. Thank you very much. Probiotics put the good stuff back in, and prebiotics are the foods that have the good stuff in them. So if you've not heard that term, prebiotics, I'd advise you to go online, look at prebiotics, and start using those kind of things. I would absolutely suggest, and that was a suggestion, not a prescription, that you would take probiotics at least a couple of weeks before a surgery if you can. Continue them after the surgery in whatever form you can find them. 
I had a nurse during the last surgery when I was telling her I was so mad at myself for not taking my own probiotics. She said, you know, I worked in a hospital back in West Virginia, and it was an orthopedic hospital. And the doctors there had realized that if they put people on probiotics before their surgeries, they were having far less complications. Use them. Remember this. To a hammer, everything looks like a nail. To a doctor, everything looks like a problem that their particular brand of doctoring can take care of. They're far more interested in masking or muffling symptoms too much of the time as opposed to getting to the causation, to the root. So they would far prefer to cut something out of you or to fuse something together or to trim that disc or to in some way alleviate the symptom instead of trying to find out what the problem actually is. There are studies, probably up to 15 years old now, research projects have shown <clears throat> that 150 men are MRI'd or X-rayed and 150 men with no back pain, 75 of them are going to have slipped discs or herniated discs or pinched nerves and no back pain. What that suggests is if you go in with back pain you have a one in two chance of having a pinched nerve or a herniated disc or a slipped disc or something. And so the doc says, look, you see that problem? We can work on that. Well, they can work on it, but in the last two years, I've heard of a new insurance code in the diagnostics code, which is called failed back surgery. So far too much of the time, we're choosing to operate on something that may or may not be helped by that specific operation. And this puts me right back to that same thing. Take charge of your process. Talk to people. Go online if you want to. You're going to find people that will swear at the surgery, people that will swear by the surgery. You're going to find all sorts of information. Ask your doctor, is there someone who's had this procedure that I can talk to? They should be able to help you with that. So seek out all the information that you can, but remember, a doctor is in business to cut or to poison. You've got to think about that. Do you really want them to have your power? Keep your power. I think the last thing I would just say is see yourself as well. See yourself as getting better. What you focus on expands. So take small actions. It can be, I watched a 93-year-old cousin in the nursing home. Every day, they pulled her out of her chair, draped her over her Walker Zimmer frame, made her walk the length of the hall, put her back in her chair. I thought, why don't you teach her to do this for herself? She might never get out of her chair, but how could this hurt? Why don't you teach her to do this for herself? Why don't you teach yourself to do this for yourself? Others have done it. You can do it too. You can turn it around. You can be well.